just put it on. Okay. Yesterday, I introduced the uh, version as a concept, and also in the end showed you how to actually go through the different steps. And we'll actually do this this afternoon using Buno as an example, which is just in a small molecule where we have one to one mapping. Um, what I'm going to do this morning is largely talking about state point dependence and transferability of coarse grain potentials. First starting with temperature, then mixing, and if we have time, we'll talk a bit about some stuff we have been doing very recently, and that is how does confinement between walls change potentials. So, just a reminder, we had the slide yesterday. <coughs> so if we go with non-bonded, we will do that again. We will do that this afternoon. We have an anatomistic radio distribution function was analyzed on the cross grain level, and that is our target. So we calculate the potential based on this REF on the magenta one, and we get this potential. If we count, if we now run the cross grain simulation based on that potential, we get another one here. Because as I said yesterday, it's a mixture between potential and free energies, and especially at high densities, the packing of the beads becomes very important. And especially as which is known since Sweet Chambers and Anderson in the early 70s, that the repulsive part of the potential is the one which dominates the local packing, whereas the more the attractive part dominates the thermodynamic sanction. Um, and then we do this a number of times, and after a few iterations, we normally get, at least for a homogeneous system, the RDF essentially perfect. So we know that that works. And this is actually an example, which I'm, which I've taken from the work of Dirk Wright. This is polyvinyl alcohol in water. The and this is a solution. The simulation was a 20 streamer of PVA in water. That's here on which it was parameterized. And then, as I already asked, the, the strength of IBI is that you can increased chain length. So what they did here, they went from a 23 mer up to about a thousand mer, and they determined the hydrodynamic radius of these molecules and compared them then against light scattering experiments. So the black dots are simulation, <coughs> the red dots are the LS, dynamic light scattering. And you see although the parameterization was done on a 23 mer, at the area of a few thousand monomers, you get quite good uh, agreement with experimental data. The advantage is here now, you could now say, people pop, typically pop, people say, that is just scaling in, in, in a good solvent. The point is, not only the slope is meaningful, but actually the three factors. And the three factors is really what you get from the idea. So, homogeneous systems, very effective. <laughs> can do this and especially if you go to much longer chain lengths and the interactions work beautifully. I've never seen a system, a homogeneous system, where you had any problems running it with um, This is actually a dynamics comparison. This is data my, one of my students did a few years ago. It means square displacements. So you know what it means square displacement is? You take, in this case, actually the means square displacement of the central monomer. So you take polymer and you go take the central monomer, not the center of mass, and you measure its mean square displacement. And we did that as a function of chain length, and we actually recovered <coughs> what we expected from polymer. Again, with the correct three factors, which you would not get for a simple one. And this is actually how the system looks like. It's the visualization of the system. These are 120 mers in a dense melt. Nothing which you have any hope to do atomistically. You could atomistic. So the relaxation times here are well beyond microseconds. And this was, uh, this is polyisoprene 
450 Kelvin, which is above the 400 Kelvin would be the glass position temperature, so we are above the glass position temperature. And this, what I show you, I just wanted to show you, is actually the very same polymer at three different heights. So we start with the white one, then we get the green one, and then we get the purple one. So what you see is known in the polymer community as rotation. So the chain moves back and forth because there are all the other chains which are encircling it. So it cannot move just randomly. So it essentially only can move along its own contour. And we see that actually very well in this model. This is something atomistically you, uh, that you cannot see because you have hundreds of, my, hundreds of nanoseconds between each of these. So that each of these snapshots you have a few hundred nanoseconds. So in order to equilibrate this, you would get a few microseconds, but in order to explain, say, the rheology of the polymer, its flow behavior, it's absolutely essential that you go to these long time scales. So this is, in a moment I tell you everything which works. And another thing which I briefly talked about yesterday, that is the effect of pressure correction. At the very end, I mentioned that you often get run to the issue that when you have optimize your gradient distribution function, you get the pressure in your cross grain simulation, which is typically much higher. And that, the reason for that is that, is that the repulsive part of the interaction is the one which dominates the local structure. So, and the long range part, which is normally attractive, has not much effect on the local structure, on the local pattern, but has a huge effect on the thermodynamics. So your optimization really gets the local repulsive part beautifully right. But the structure doesn't really care if you have a slight change in the potential, say, between a nanometer and one nanometer. So you typically have a color between one and one point five nanometers. And the first half nanometer, three quarters of a nanometer is really where yeah, the structure is happening. And that's where you get right. And then what happens further out, your system, your optimization doesn't really care about. It. So what you normally have then to do, you add just a linear potential. Linear potential is obviously constant force. So you add a constant force, which you at, at typically long time, at the long distances. So between a nanometer out to the cutoff, you just essentially add a constant force, and what you do by that, essentially, you get, you, you get your uh, pressure back into where it should be, and at the same time, as it's at so large distances, you normally do not change the look. Uh, another thing which I briefly talked to, and also Professor Lamb said, is one normally should ignore the end monomers in the optimization. Why is that? What is the difference between an end monomer and the central one? It has only one neighbor, absolutely. And there's, there's only one connected neighbor that makes two, two important. One is the one I'm showing here, that's the dynamics. And monomers are much, much faster than central ones. They essentially can wiggle, can move around without the overall polymer carrying about it. The central monomer, which I showed you earlier, cannot do that. In order for a central monomer to move, essentially the whole polymer is moving. So, therefore, the end monomers are much faster, and then and means they are much more dynamic, which at the same time means that typically the local density around the end model is slightly smaller. So you have a you have a higher you have a lower density, a higher dynamics. But of course, in the coarse grain model, that also comes by virtue of them being end monomers again in the coarse grain model. So therefore, you don't want to double count these effects. So you normally Calculate the RDF only between internal monomers and optimize that, and let the difference of end monomers come back 
by the virtue that they are also again end polymers in the coarse grade model, and then otherwise it would overcome. Right, it's not a big difference in practice. Um, in the RDFs between end monomers, central monomers, and mon central monomers, central monomers is normally not a big difference, but it's, it's visible. And you, you don't have to do it this way. As I said, the whole thing is an optimization and it may just take a few more snaps and you will get it back. So it works both ways, but normally ignoring end monomers is a more efficient way. So, but now we come to the point of transferability, different models. This, I think I showed this slide already yesterday, is for the ice cream of in two different neighborhoods. One is for the ice cream in the melt. So it's pure for the ice cream system. Um, in this case, the optimization was done with tetramers, so 10, 10 monomers each. So this is where we actually did the optimization. And the black dots are the melt. The red dots are for the ice cream in solution of polygamy. And you see that, first of all, even in the agnostic system, you see a difference in size. This is measuring the radius of generation, so how far extended the molecules are. Um, but more importantly, there's also the different slope. So this is a double logarithmic here. But that means the size of the polymer scales differently if you have to put it in a solution or in a melt. That means there is, the physics tells you immediately there is no hope to have one model which can describe both. Because you cannot get the same, the same uh, scaling, different scaling of the same model. That will not change. Um, that already is one of the, this is essentially the major step, the major statement here of this second talk is if you want, if you change your conditions, you, in almost all cases, have to be optimized. Except you just change chain length. That doesn't matter. If you just change the chain length, make the chain longer or shorter, that is then you can transform that. And that is the main strength. But everything else, temperature, um, solution concentrations, or even confinement, may be So, let's talk first about temperature. This slide shows two pages. What you see here on the very left is polystyrene. Polystyrene optimized at 450 Kelvin, that's in the melt, and then cooled down to, I think, 350. <coughs> it takes polystyrene forms the glass, so it doesn't crystallize. If you look at that, for all purposes, this is actually a very good polymer crystal, what you see. You see everything nice and cheap, so this polystyrene crystal. Okay? That means it doesn't work. The same what you see here on the right, that's actually an example I will now talk a bit more in detail. That's also taffetto. If you don't know what that is, doesn't matter, don't come to that. Also taffetto is kind of the fruit fly of organic glass formers. Um, so very nice, make forms a very nice glass. On the right hand side, it's OTP optimized at 300 Kelvin, simulated at 300 Kelvin. And you see that it's a nicely disordered system. In the middle, you see OTP at 300 Kelvin simulated at 230. That again is a crystalline, a crystalline structure. But at 230 is below TG, below the glass transition temperature, which is about 260. So if you're going, that means again, this system crystallizes. And that's not for the class. What do you think again is the issue? Why do we not get the structure right if we change the temperature significantly? What are we missing? Something 
You are you're on the right track, absolutely. You are not optimizing dynamics at all. This is all only structure. But the point is, we are sampling only the configurations at a certain temperature. And then if you think about it in the sense of, say, here's the grammar rating, you always can rebate to another our temperature. But if the two um, distributions don't overlap, you can you essentially just get noise. And that is exactly what's happening here. That the configurational distributions at the different temperatures have very small overlap. And therefore, you haven't sampled the relevant configurations at the other condition. So therefore, there is no reason by that we should get it right. It would be just by chance if we got it right or not. That's not the example I'm talking about now first is of the thermal OTP. was work of Jeda Gosh five years ago. So again, the reference of all these will be at the end of the talk. OTP is a very simple molecule. It's essentially you take three benzene rings. And you connect the two other ones in auto position of each other on the middle one. So this is the United States representation. There are always hydrogens hanging around. Except these ones don't have hydrogens. So here you have hydrogens. And the mapping is the mapping onto three interaction lines. So the yellow ones are the superatoms. And we have two types of superatom. We have the central entity and we have the two outer rings. We have the central ring. Yeah, question? OK. <laughs> um, there's the, cent the central ring. We say the central ring it may behave differently from the outer rings. And these two have to behave the same because they are symmetric. So this is first the atomistic simulation. And this this RDF here is a really all atom RDF so between all the carbons. The black line is a 230, the red line is a 300. And what you see is that you don't see much. Which is not really surprising because what is the difference between a glass and a liquid? The diffusion the dynamics, but not essentially very little of structure. The structural difference is minuscule. So we wouldn't expect a huge difference. So this is atomistic simulations. Or as that of all the this is now all the F of all the carbons. So therefore you have all these many peaks which are partially bonded peaks. But here also the non bonded parts. And you see there is a little bit of a difference and no surprise that the black, if at all, the black one is more pronounced than the red one, because at the lower temperature, you would have a little bit of more structure. You typically have a little bit of more structure in the glass than you do in a liquid. But essentially, the glass is the first liquid. We actually see that in the um, hundreds of years old cathedrals in Europe, if you measure, say, in Chartres or so, the, dif the difference of the thickness of the glass, of the stained glass window at the top and the bottom, it has changed a few minutes. The bottom is a few millimeters thicker than the top because it has flown over the century down for and make it makes a difference. So the glass is a liquid but a very, very, very slow. So which of course leads to one big issue, which is what? That's the sampling of course. Uh, normally a glass has the kind of working definition of a glass is that your equilibration time is beyond the minute or beyond the second. People make it differently, but that will be way beyond anything you can sample. So we have to make a lot of, we have to make sure that we are sampling configurations reasonably. So this is, if we just do iterative Boltzmann inversion of IBI, and this is actually the RDF, I think, of central ring, central ring. Because we have um, three interaction potentials, we come to that in the we come to that back later. Why we need to have three interaction potentials all separately? Um, but this is one of the interaction potentials optimized to 30 or optimized to 300. Doesn't look too different, does it? 
There is, however, especially the area around four angstroms, exactly in the repulsive local part, which is the structurally dominant part, there are differences. They are not huge, but they are there. But this is the difference. And this is what happens. So we take these two potentials, which I just showed you. The 231 and the 300 one, and we run both at 231. Exactly do the same thing. At 230, you get this. At 300, you get this complete overestimation, which leads to this question. That means, in this case, obviously does not work. Can this potential, which we get at 300, is not transferable down 70 Kelvin to 230. We actually did this systematically, and interestingly, it works almost exactly to the point of class position. And we can go down to about 260 and get beautiful agreement with experiments and with atmospheric simulations, but as soon as we go below the class position temperature, is actually the uh, stars to crystallize. And as I said, sometimes it actually works. Um, this is, the red line is the atomistic model. And two black lines are the 230 and 300 optimized fourth rate models, all simulated at 260. So between the two. There is a difference, no question about that. And the one which, beha which behaves better depends actually on where you are. You have here at the local distances, the 230 behaves better, at the larger distances, 300 behaves better. So, but overall, they behave both reasonable. That means, in this case, we have about 300 Kelvin, uh, 30, 40 Kelvin, which you can play around, but you cannot transform really across the class of the temperature. Then the system fails. That means, welcome to the head, what we see with temperatures, there is a span of transferability, but we don't know the a priori, which is what it meant. We need the order of the Another part of transferability is the extras. So, more and more systems are mixed systems, especially the one I will talk about tomorrow as the bigger example, which will be a poly polythiophene C60 mixture for organic photovoltaics. So, you have to be able, you want to predict the system mixed. <coughs> so, and obviously, we run into the same issues, basically. So, what do we have to do? What are the ideas here? This is first again what we see. This is polystyrene in solution or in the ground. I showed you a similar idea from polyisoprene before, where I showed you the experiment, the results. This is now the LDFs. And again, it shows you immediately that the transfer from the solution to a melt will not So solution and melt is something which, from basic, from basic polymer physics, is out of the way. We may have a chance, and in most cases actually it will work, if we have just <coughs> mixed melts or uh, or highly concentrated solutions, but if you are going to double solution, it will not work. This is the first system which we did. This is the paper from uh, G. Sutton, Journal of Chemical Theory and Computation, 2006. Again, the reference is in the end. This is polyisoprene polystyrene. Polyisoprene polystyrene, we chose that because it has a very peculiar behavior which a lot of polymer systems have, and that is it phase separates the increasing chain length. This system is miscible if you have short oligomers, and if you increase chain length, it phase separates. A lot of polymer systems do that. Um, you can explain that by a of theories, especially from the Abbey theory. So, I mean, that, that would be an interesting test. Can 
our system at least describe that. Because that is what we saw as the big advantage in homopolymers, that we always can transfer for increasing chain length. So do we at least retain that advantage? And if you change for chain length, that is still behaves the right way. Because if that is gone, then we are completely lost. And then maybe we can even do some change in concentrations. But that was the idea. So first we check bonded interactions and no surprise there, essentially it doesn't matter. This is the bonded interaction of polystyrene. One in a mixture between, poly, uh, between polystyrene and polyisoprene, the other one with polystyrene, and essentially they are on But that was okay. That's not absolute bare minimum. If that wouldn't work, okay, that's, then then something would be severely wrong. Okay, that's fine. But why do we expect at all that there may be differences in the interactions? And that is the following. If you have a system of homopolymers, the, the red ones, I call them now A, the green, the blue ones are bees. Um, if you only have the red bees, the only normal interaction there is is AA interaction. And that's homogeneous throughout the system. If you now have a system in the mix, even the AA interaction is not necessarily the same as in the homopolymer. Because at a certain distance, the AA interaction at the distance A2 polymers away may be mediated by B polymers. So that this interaction here, you have an intervening B. So the effective attraction between these two is not the same as if you would be in a pure AA system. So that is the main reason that even the homo interactions may not be the same. So of course, screening of mixtures. That means we have three particle functions. We have considering only the, the non-bonded, because that the bonded are not the issue. The bonded are effective. We have the AA, the AB, and the B. We can now, of course, do this either parallel or serial. So we can either say we now optimize all at the same time. We do a simulation. We measure all three on the apps at the same time. We optimize all, we update all three at the same time and continue there. Or we may do it in a serial fashion. What in practice turns out to be most efficient is you typically have the pure A and the pure B anyway. You start with them because they are normally only weakly in effect. The one which is the, more, the, the hardest one is the AB. The AA is slightly different and the BB is slightly different. The whole system, but normally you start with them, leave them alone at their home values, optimize the AB first, and then re optimize the AA and the B. So that's kind of what we normally do in general. That was almost the wrong way. So, there is one point which was once raised by a referee, and that is if you know atomistic simulations, you normally use the Lorentz parallel mixing rules, and you don't even think about them if you take them as you. Um, everybody knows what Logan's Bethel or Mixing Rules are? So, if you have, of course, uh, okay, let's establish. Sure. Logan's Bethel. Oh, okay. So, who knows what they are? Who knows what? Who doesn't know what they are? Okay. <laughs> okay, if you do have domestic simulations, you have into your force, your favorite force, your amber, charm, what have you, you have interactions for each of your atoms. But how do atoms of type A interact with atoms of type B? That is normally not explicitly specified, and for that you use mixing rules. So you say, I, I can calculate analytically the 
AB interaction from the AA and the BP interaction. And the standard mixing rules are that sigma NB is one half sigma A plus sigma B. So geometric, whereas epsilon AB, so this is the algebraic, is epsilon A, epsilon B, and the square root. So we have a geometric mixing rule. That is standard Lorentz Bertholdt. And what this one referee told me uh, in this paper, why do you do this? There are mixing rules. They work. No big deal. At least not on the course right now. Yeah, most of you are even there sometimes in debate. There are a few other mixing rules out there. But at the course rate level, they definitely do not work. This is the example here, especially on the right hand side, which is Lorentz graphologic like mixing rules. Um, this is polyisoprene polystyrene. <coughs> the right hand side is optimized, that the AB interaction is specifically optimized, and the system phase separates as it should. If I take the Lorentz graphologic mixing rules, the system doesn't phase separate. The system stays fixed at um, chain length of the so that means you get a completely wrong phase behavior if you assume mixing rules. So mixing rules in the cross grain level to get one. And if you look at doing the Martini model, even there you have a specific table. Martini does not use Lorentz Bertholdt. Martini uses specific interactions between different molecule types. Uh, that's uh, and that is something which most people don't realize. It is, in that sense, a true core strain potential and not an agonistic potential. And again, here on the left hand side, I we took another mixing rule, which is just an algebraic mixing rule, where we said, okay, now we take essentially effectively the epsilon and took half one potential plus half the other potential, so not a geometric which you would have in Lorentz to by the algebraic mixing, and again, you get mixing there, you should get phase separation. So that means you don't get away, you have to do all interactions optimized in the package. And this is just how it looks like. This is actually the PIPS system at a 50 50 molar ratio, 10 mass, so 10 mass of PI, 10 mass of PS. They are just still visible, which is good, because you don't want to do the optimization in a phase separated system that um, leads to the issue that you don't have really enough contacts of the hetero systems. So you always try, want to try to optimize it in the mixed system. So you may have a, so you may have that case to look at the experimented system if you have a mixing temperature or miscibility gap or what have you, and you want to go into the area of phase behaving of space where yeah, the system is. In this case, you have to go to short chain lengths, which is great because we won't do that anyway. And now, these are the iterations. In this case, you probably can't, cannot see the numbers. It's, it's about 25 iterations we needed in this case. So this is significantly more than what we needed for the simple whole point. And now, this is chain X. Um, first of all, these are on the X again of a pure system and of a mixed system. The black is the pure system. The magenta is the mixed system. And what we do now here, we increase chain length. And what we see is polystyrene, polystyrene. We see that with increasing chain length, the first peak in the RDF. That is exactly what we want. That means with increasing chain length, we see a stronger and stronger preference for the mixing. So it looks like that at least uh, this is the first indication that we might get the phase separation right. And this is actually now a snapshot of the system. So red is PS, white is PI. These are all 50-50 mole, 50-50 by mole mixture. By mole I mean you have 10 mass of PS and 10 mass of PI and the same number of them. 
which is not a fifth. Um, normally, if you look at experimental papers, you see weight by weight mixtures. In that case, the weight of PS per mole is higher than the weight of PI, so it's not a 50 50 by weight. So at 7 months, you see they are nicely mixed. At 10 months, you see they are still reasonably mixed, but you see an indication of demixing. So the 10 months is very the optimization. For 30 months, it's essentially now uh, lamellar morphology. And for 60 months, it's clearly a lamellar morphology. Uh, the lamellar morphology is very expected in this case, as long as the two numbers of polymers are the same. So then, in phase one periodic boundary conditions, you will normally have a lamellar the metamorphology. We also can get cylindrical or spherical uh, morphologies if we play around with the No This is actually now a dynamics of the phase actuation, and this is a very long scale, long time dynamics, and this is exactly what one would expect. So we set up the system perfectly mixed. I think this is. Um, 30 months or 40 months, something like that. Um, and you see that the red ones, which are the polystyrenes in this case, they start to cluster. You see something which almost looks like a cylindrical morphology here intermediately. So that you have a cylinder of PS, and eventually the system tries to, of course, minimize the PS PI contacts, and by that it forms a metal morphology which is the lowest free energy for this um, mixing for this mixing ratio. As I said, we can get different morphologies, we can get spherical ones, we can get cylindrical ones, and we can get the numbers. All as a function of chain length or concentration. Essentially, it's largely the number of PS monomers to the number of PI monomers, which makes a difference. If you have Almost equal number, you get a lamella. If you have a, have a significantly more of one than of the other, then you get cylinders. And if you have the vast majority of one over the others, then you get um, spheres. Where it's obvious the spheres and the cylinders are the minority component, and the frame and the rest of the system is the majority. And now we can play, play things like, okay, we can measure the thickness of the interface between uh, at the lamella and we see that the increase in chain length becomes, um, the thickness of the interface becomes smaller and smaller and means saturation becomes more and more pronounced. And in the end, you can get something like a morphology diagram. So we have isotropic in the very low corner where we have where the system is made admissible. We have a lamella along the diagonal where here we have the polyisoprene chain length, here the polystyrene chain length. In this case, we always have the same number of chains of the two types, and we vary the chain lengths, and by that vary the number of bonds. So we have the polyisoprene chain length on the bottom, polystyrene, obviously we have cylinder, we have um, lamella here, we have styrene cylinders here. Where we have more pi and we have styrene spheres, where we have significantly more pi corresponding to isoprene cylinders and isoprene spheres. <coughs> How am I doing with time? Uh, okay. I'm going to Okay. So, I'm maybe going too fast, but it's okay. Um, so, that means, if we look at temperature we saw, we had an issue. If we look at concentration, we, the system in mixtures, as long as we stay at a, even with a large majority of one over the other, we get still the right morphologies. So that, looked, that looks in general fine. So transferability around, around mixtures is normally significantly working. Whereas temperature is not so a problem, and then what we have done very recently is confined. So, um, this was the work of my PhD student, Best by Bayer Hoku, actually, over the last few years. There she looked at this polymer system, actually, polymer solutions in slips. 
its waveforms. So this is how the system atomistically looks like. We have here graphene sheets. The green ones are for the ice cream polymers, whereas the blue ones are solids, and for the styrene polymers. So the question is now, if we coarse grain the system, can we use that model also under the climate? So what we did, we simulated atomistically the system with three different thicknesses of that, of that and they're always in the nanometer range. We used the middle one of the three to set up a coarse grain model of it and then used that model to simulate the other two confinements. And we were looking how much does it change. Also, of course, at the same time, we um, did this for bulk, the bulk concentration at the same concentration. Um, the paper is not yet out, but it's de facto accepted in macromolecules. We have to send it back. Um, and will probably be out in macromolecules by the end of this year. So, this is first atomist. Polymers. Yes, these are, atom these are atomistic data of the triangle, the heat angle distribution. So, even intramolecular, this is the softest intramolecular degree the, there's a magenta line, which is the, is the bulk. There's a blue line, which is a delta C of 6.23 nanometers. So that's the weakest confinement, so the largest, thick, the largest thickness of the system. And they are very similar. But if you confine the system to down to 4.5 or 2.8 nanometers, we see that the average conformation of the polymer changes, which is bad news. It means, on average, we see a different dihedral distribution if we change the system in confinement. And the same, of course, for the radial distribution functions. And typically, all of them go bulk, weaker, um, 6 nanometers, 4 nanometers, 2.8 2, 2 nanometers. So, the system, the more you compress it, the less it behaves bulk like, both in its radial distribution function as well as its in its internal These are density profiles. And uh, those you have polystyrene and toluene mixture again. Um, the PS and toluene confined on these two lines. So you see First of all, of course, at the surface, you see some absorption of toluene. That's clear. Um, but there's only, it shows the model that there's only weak, weak absorption of the polystyrene to the surface. So then we don't have, on top of that, the problem that we have a lot of absorption. So the surface is more or less neutral in absorbing the polymer. But still, you see that. The density profile, and this is the, the middle confinement, the 4.5 nanometer system, is felt all the way through the middle. So the density profile is not flat across a uh, 4 something nanometer system. This again, this is now coarse graining. And we chose, in this case, the middle one to do the optimization as well. And this is comparison of the middle one in its dihedrals to the half confined system and to the weakly confined system. And you see that in both cases you see differences, and of course they are opposite. In this case, the green one, the CG, goes is, stays below here, whereas here it's above. So systematically we chose the middle one, but we don't see that there are differences in the And the, the top is now the polystyrene density distributions, so density profiles, in yet atomistic against, against coarse grain if we take the model which we optimized in the middle of the 4.5 nanometer. And you see that 
the weaker confine, that's the blue line and the magenta line, they are, I would say at least, comparable. They are not great, but they are at least comparable. And it's nothing like we have a perfect agreement like you normally had at the RBFs. But if you look at the green line and the red line, which is the highly confined system, you're going down to less than three nanometers. There, I would not say that this is what the system is. Clearly, what we are doing here is we are pushing the limits of the method, and we are pushing, I would say, beyond the limits of the method. Um, but so the issue will be, yeah, huh? whatever. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine. Should not be. I'm essentially done anyway. Um, so the point is, at this point, what can we do? What are the? So we have to. What is the problem? Anybody knows what the problem is? Why does it not work? Why is confinement worse than? Cause the system to different state points as a function of this. The system is not in the same state point. You go at the surface and in the ball, you are effectively in two different state points. You have the interaction with the surface, you have the other interaction with the surface. You don't have a homogeneous neighborhood. Therefore, as the system is effectively in more than one state point, the whole concept of IDI has to fail. So, you can either now say, okay, I take two models, one at the surface and one at the bottom, and I match the two, or you can go to something like a hybrid model where you model the system close to the surface in a, in a fully atomistic way. But this way, you will be able to match it maybe at, in, a, in an effective manner at one confinement, but you will not be able to describe the confined system as a function of confinement in general with I That fundamentally will not work. Yes? Like a you, that's something that you probably have to do. We haven't done that, but that is actually that is, but that is again the function. Yes. Yeah, so that's exactly what I. Um, you can make a CG model for any state point, but essentially this model is only valid at exactly that state point. And you normally have some freedom around state point. We saw in the area of temperature. If you a few degrees Kelvin, as well as in concentrations where you normally have a reasonable degree of um, transferability. As long as the conformations from one state point to the other are not too different, that's the problem especially in the area of confinement, that within the system itself you have different families of polymers which you essentially all take at once and that will not and actually, for this afternoon, um, I put all the files in this download. I will put it all on this here. So, <coughs> what you find in that directory is a tau file, a tau GC file, as well as all the others. As well as all the files which are in there, so whatever you favor, you can just download that. It's a, it, it links to a public problems. And the confinement uh, thing, is it, is it only the different surface that it's facing, or also just that the entropic landscape is changing? It's both. It's both. The point is, it's the different conformations that the polymers at the surface and in the body have different conformations. And therefore, effectively, you are at different state points. Can, can you have any way you can think of solve this? Yes. Um, I'm collaborating with a group in England to do this in a hybrid model that we do the surface interaction atomistically and the center in a coarse grain phase, so that we do a atomistic um, coarse graining hybrid model. That you simulate some pieces of coarse grain, some pieces of this. Well, that's all the entropic uh, problem. We have like, you know, chaperon problems that just, uh, like, grow real, that you lock a protein in a, in a chamber, and 
Yeah. Now, essentially, everything is a. You only take one state point, the bulk state point, coarse grain, and everything which goes away from that state point, which is the surface, you do that to rest. 